Hi, I'm Sam Candy. Welcome to Sustain Talks. Today, I'm joined by Andrew Adeni, author of The Circle of Leadership, which is a framework for creating and leveraging culture. He's also a consultant who helps leaders and small business owners improve employee engagement, retention and productivity, and organizational culture. Big topics, big topics. Andrew, I'm delighted to have you here. I can't wait to delve deeper and find out more about you. Um, please do tell us a bit more about you, your book, your background, and what brought you here. Yeah. Hello, hello. Thank you for having me. It's an honor and a privilege to be able to have this conversation. I can talk about these topics all day, so we'll try to keep it succinct and, and impactful. But um, yes, my name is Andrew Adeni, author, consultant, speaker, as you mentioned. And a lot of the work I do is really at the intersection of business strategy, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and workplace culture. Uh, you know, when I think about the statistics that Gallup uh, produces, you'll see that about two-thirds of people hate their job. Yeah. And that's disheartening to me and very disappointing. And when I started to realize just how widespread it was for people to hate their work and made me want to figure out why. And I went on this journey of figuring out that it's really leadership and culture that, that plays, plays the biggest role in that. And that's what set me on my journey to interviewing leaders and to doing a lot of research. And that led to my book, uh, The Circle of Leadership, which is a framework for creating and leveraging culture. So super excited to be here to be able to dive more into the topics for sure. Yeah, sure. Um, can you tell us a bit about, obviously, we're not giving away everything about the book, but can you tell us a little bit more about that framework and how it works? Yeah. yeah, so in the book, I walk people through what I call the three P's of culture, and that's purpose, people, and process. So the first thing I walk people through is basically how do you prioritize purpose? And, and what we're asking ourselves is why? Why are we here? Why was this created? What are we trying to accomplish? And really getting down to what's our mission? What's our vision? What are our guiding principles that can serve as our core values? And that's very important before you start trying to get people on the bus. Um, and then the, the next uh, aspect of, of, the, of the cycle, if you will, is uh, to amplify uh, your people and to prioritize your people. And by doing that, it's slowing down the interview process, not dragging it out, but being more intentional with getting to know the applicants that you're actually considering, right? You don't go out on, on one date with somebody and ask to marry them, right? Uh, but a lot of companies have this, this quick fire speed, uh, speed round of getting to know candidates. And at the end of the day, they truly don't really know candidates yeah. and, and, and applicants know how to interview. They know what to say. They know what needs to be said to be able to get the roles. And it's hard to kind of break through that and really get to know applicants. So I talk about how do you, how can you be more intentional in that process? And then we talk about the last P, which is, which is process. And we talk about how we can simplify our processes. And that, come, that covers everything from development and training to delegation to accountability, how to put your foot down without stomping it is, is how I like to say. Uh, and, and really those three Ps when woven together creates a framework that leaders can use to take a poor culture, make it better, or take an already good culture and, and elevate it from there. Yeah. So was there a point that before you wrote the book from your background, was there something that inspired you to oh, yeah. write it? <laughs> yes, there was. So I worked for an yeah. international retailer uh, right out of college. And the division I worked for was considered one of the best divisions in, in America. And I just got my career started seeing great leadership, seeing empathetic leaders, seeing people who invested in training and really cared about the individual more than they did profits. So I just assumed that's how all leaders were and that's how all places were. Well, I got a promotional opportunity to go to another division on the East Coast that was a struggling division. They were one of the worst in the company at the time, which is one of the reasons why they needed additional support. And when I got there, it felt like a completely different company. And I was like, how can two divisions in the same in the same country within the same company be so drastically different? And what I realized was leadership and culture was the biggest difference. There was no difference in terms of access to talent. There's no different resources that were used. The training curriculum was the exact same. It literally just came down to senior leadership and culture. And I just so happened to start my master's program at Michigan State University uh, online while I was working there. So I was able to get the book knowledge on 
how can you create a really good culture, what it's like to be an effective leader, while also experiencing the exact opposite of an excellent culture, which was what I was used to. And that set me on a journey to figure out, well, how could somebody fix this if they want, if they inherited the sinking ship? And that's what led me on the journey to wanting to answer that question. And that's what I was able to figure out with this book, The Circle of Leadership. Yeah, great. I um, always think, I always go back and think about leaders that I've had over the years, um, some really amazing ones, some terrible ones, and the terrible ones always make me think of how I don't want to be a leader. Um, but, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you've seen it too. Um, what, you know, when you're looking at someone in there, you're admiring good leadership, and you've obviously had the conversations with lots of them, what what does really good leadership look like? Oh, man, uh, two things come to mind. Number one, someone who has a high level of emotional intelligence, they're self-aware, empathetic in their approach, not afraid to hold people accountable because they've clarified expectations. They've given them the resources and tools to be effective in their work. Uh, so at that point, if you need to have a tough conversation, you're really just the messenger. They should already know what is going to come down because you've already been so crystal clear on what you expect and you've shown that you truly invest in that individual. So I found that if I had to pinpoint just one thing, it's it's definitely emotional intelligence uh, and then the self-awareness and, and empathy that comes with that. The other aspect is something that I heard from a thought leader uh, out of the Dave Ramsey uh, network, and he shared that leaders have to give their team air. And it's an acronym. We're not talking about oxygen, but something as important as oxygen when we talk about leadership and developing a culture. And that's appreciation, inspiration, and recognition. It doesn't cost you any money. But the best leaders find ways to appreciate their team early and often, make it genuine, make it timely, and they inspire their team by figuring out why are we here and how does that purpose align with that individual uh, in order to get them to do their best work. And then lastly, recognizing that person for the work they do and the contributions that, that they bring, but also just acknowledging who they are and the value that you see in that. Oh, wow. Um, I'm definitely going to take some things from that. Um, I, the other side of it, obviously, is culture. And again, I, I, God, I can remember working in a company. It was the most horrific culture. And <laughs> it led to working around really, really bad people. But what does good culture look like? Good culture is, it, so when you have a good culture, you don't need the leader to make a lot of decisions. There's social control that happens because peers are willing to hold each other accountable. So that I think that's one sign that you'll see. Another thing is people are more open to being vulnerable. They're more open to be transparent. They're not keeping a log of all the good things that they've done because they need to make sure that they have their internal resume in, in place in case they need to vouch for that they're doing a good job or vouch that they need to get a promotion. They know that they're going to be recognized for their work, so they focus on the, on the cause at hand. I think you also don't have situations where you have the meeting after the meeting. You know, when you have a good culture, there's space created for people to air out exactly how they feel and get everything off their chest in the meeting before they leave. And that way you don't have to pick up the phone, excuse me, to call a peer and say what actually needed to be said in the meeting. So those are just a, a couple of the, the first things that pop in my head when I think about what does a good culture look like? It's, it's really how does the team feel? And a team that is in a good culture will feel like they can be transparent. They'll feel like they're recognized for their contributions and they feel like they have opportunities to grow. So for a lead then to, you know, create that space, what's the number one thing that a leader can do to create that, you know, or to help support that culture then? It goes back to my three P's, right? It, it's in order. So I talk about purpose first, then people, then process. So the first thing a leader needs to do is establish what is our purpose? Like, what are our goals and why? Like, why are we here? What are the things that we're willing to sacrifice for? What are our non-negotiables? Yeah. And how do we build consensus around that? That's number one, because if, you know, for example, say innovation is a core principle for you. Well, it's hard to innovate when people aren't open to sharing 
feedback and their thoughts and are, are, are and are not willing to fail if you don't have those those ingredients you're not going to be able to innovate so if your purpose is to innovate that literally starts to influence what a leader needs to do and the culture they need to create so it's very important to get that purpose uh, aspect correct you know in my book i talk about stefan larson who was a Ralph Lauren Polo executive. And there was a time where he took over Old Navy when they were struggling and he was able to turn them around and get consecutive quarters of growth after they had been spiraling downward for a long time. And when they asked him, hey, how did you turn around uh, the organization? He said he went back to the founding documents, to the founding information to figure out what was Old Navy supposed to be? Why was it created? What was the founder's initial intent? And how do we get back to that? And one of the things he found was that innovation was a core principle for them. But the company he inherited, they did not innovate. Why? Because people weren't willing to be transparent. They weren't willing to be vulnerable. They weren't willing to fail publicly. So now you have people withholding ideas, not willing to throw things out there to get better, and literally started to create the, the opposite of the culture that they actually wanted to create. So that's why it's so important to start with purpose. Yeah, that's so, so good and so important and something that I think about every single day. Um, yeah. You must have seen some companies get it wrong. Um, what are the common mistakes that you see when businesses are trying to create a culture that, yeah? Well, the biggest progress that can be made when it comes to culture is around the intangibles. And the biggest mistake I see is when leaders focus on the tangibles of business. So we'll give you free coffee. We will give you this perk. You know, we'll, we'll talk about this. We'll give you this, you know, we'll give you free tickets to this. We'll give you all these things that are just tangible items that aren't bad things. But do those things truly make somebody feel appreciated for their work? For their work? Do those things make them feel like they're going to be recognized? Do those people make? Do those things make people feel like they're valued and that they have opportunities to grow in, in the organization, or are they just transactional things? And that's the biggest mistake I see. I, I think if you really want to let people know that you value them and you care, the intangibles is really the way to do it. Remembering your spouse's name your kids names remember that somebody just graduated in your family last week making it a big deal when you have a work anniversary or a marriage anniversary those are the those are the things that a lot of leaders just aren't doing that can make all the world of a difference yeah i i i know like i remember when i walked into a company and realized how bad their culture was and i was adamant that i was still gonna deliver what i wanted to deliver and work with my team in a different way but how you know how do you when you go into a company and there's and you're a senior leader and there's really bad culture and it's there and people are unwilling to change how do you how do you change that where do you start you start with your senior leader team senior leadership team um you ask a lot of questions ask a lot a lot of questions right i think when you're going in your thoughts should be let me figure out where we're currently at let me figure out where we were intended to be based on the purpose, mission, vision, values, et cetera. And then let me evaluate the people I have on my team mm. because some people are gonna be unwilling to change. Some people are not going to be able to embody the principles that you're trying to live by as you grow the organization. And if that's the case, that's okay. Let them go and let them find a place where they can be in alignment with that organization and their values. But you have to have people who exemplify that. That's that's super important. And um, you know, Jim Collins talks about getting the right people on the bus, making sure they're in the right seats and determining where you're gonna go from there. That's a big, big uh, task for a senior leader because that senior leadership team is gonna be responsible for driving that culture within their respective departments and teams. So if you're not creating that culture as a senior leadership team, it's gonna be hard for that to trickle down. So as a senior leader, you gotta be thinking, okay, how can I serve my senior leadership team you know a lot of times we have the organizational chart that'll show the ceo and the senior leadership team and 
VPs and directors and all of that. I like to flip that around. You know, I like to think of the CEO at the bottom. You're the seed, you're the foundation. You're the one who's actually, you're the chief service officer. You have to serve everybody, starting with your leadership team. They're the people that are gonna hold up the organization and so on and so forth. So I think if leaders can have that visual, that visual of flipping an organizational chart around, that'll inform them on where they need to start. Yeah, that's that's amazing. I've never I've never heard that before, but that just makes so much sense. Yeah. Uh, but there's going to be some bad eggs in there. There always are in some companies. People that you know they're adamant that they want to do it their way, and they've done it before, and they've been there for years. How do you influence those people to um, to change? Yeah, I think, it's, I think it goes back to understanding the individual, understanding what's important to them, what guides their behavior, their, this, their decisions, but also making it clear how you're going to operate this organization and understanding or being able to articulate to them why it's important that they get on board with the way that you want that organization to go. Mm-hmm. And, and I think if you can clearly articulate the why, why is it important for you to foster an environment where your team can fail fast and fail forward? Well, it's important because innovation is a core principle for us. So if you're not doing that in your respective department, you're actually op- op- or working oppositely of what we're trying to create. So I think as a leader, you have to ask yourself, are you clear on the why that you're doing what you're doing and the value added to the organization and to that individual? And if you do that, Then I think it just comes down to the leader that we're talking about making a decision on, does this work for me or not? And I think the biggest thing leaders need to understand is everyone's not going to be on board, and that is fine. And the sooner you can realize who's going to be able to get on board with what you're trying to create and who's not, the easier it's going to be for you to be able to accelerate. Yeah, Um, we've talked a lot about culture and, you know, there's obviously so many companies are trying to get it right with diversity, inclusion, equity. Um, What are your takes on that and how leaders can create that within a company? Mm. Create it well as well. Talk about this for a couple hours by itself. Um, Uh You know, when I think about diversity, equity, and inclusion, one of the first things that come to mind is just definitions, understanding what things mean. And there's still a lot of people that uh, are mixed up on equality and equity. You know, some of those basic terms and principles, understanding equality is the same. uh, And equity is about custom tools and resources to help people do their best work. Both are important, but a lot of people try to apply equality as a blanket approach across the board, which doesn't always lead to fair outcomes or what you need to do. So the first thing I think about is just understanding the terms. The second thing I think about is what's the end result of having a diverse, equitable and inclusive culture? Is it just to check the box to say, oh, our organization is doing something to support diversity, or is it true, truly about transformational change? You know, and, and I think the a good culture who does DEI correctly will have a culture of belonging, where people feel like they're valued, they're heard, they're respected, and that they can contribute to a team in their own unique way. And I think that solves a lot of the engagement issues we see in cultures as well. So those are some of my initial thoughts of just understanding the definitions and knowing what the end result is, which should be creating a culture of belonging. Oh, that's so good. Um, Andrew, I we randomly met on this thing called lunch club which everybody should look it up it's where you're introduced to somebody that you would never meet before and um have a 45 minute lunch chat and it was it was so inspiring the first time that I met you which led to us doing this um and you do inspire me and listening to you now I'm like I'm gonna do this I'm gonna do that I'm gonna make sure I do this so so thank you so much who inspires you though where do you get your inspiration from I'm an avid reader, listen to a lot of podcasts. So Entree Leadership Podcast, it's one of my favorite podcasts. It's within the Dave Ramsey uh, network that has been a huge inspiration. I think about Simon Sinek, uh, who's an author, thought leader. He inspires me and is a big big resource that I leverage when I talked about the purpose aspect in my book. Uh, And then even Patrick Lencioni, he has a bunch of different books on culture and employee engagement. So he's another thought leader that that I really respect. Uh, There's another book called Extreme Ownership from Jocko Willick, who was uh, a former Navy SEAL. 
a Navy SEALsman and uh, in the book Extreme Ownership, man, you don't want to talk about accountability and getting a crash course and, and how leaders should conduct themselves and, and hold their teams and themselves accountable. Highly recommend that book as well. That's been a, a huge inspiration for me. Oh, wow. Well, and of course, your book, The Circle of Leadership. I, you know, I'm, I so appreciate your time. Um, I'm, I'm so pleased to be able to do this podcast and share um, these interviews with, with so many people. So thank you so much. If anyone is interested, um, look at Andre up. We're connected on LinkedIn. I'm going to share his uh, uh, contact details and please do out, go out and get the Circle of Leadership Thank you so much for your time. This has been really, really inspiring. I appreciate you. Thank you so much for your time. It's been an honor. Appreciate right. it. Take care. All right.